It all started with a simple concept. Business processes shouldn't be cumbersome because your time is too valuable to be wasted. At Papersave, we are committed to changing the way you do business in this digital age. Seamless integration. Simple. Predictive. Intelligent. Anywhere, anytime. Modern. Built on modern technology and architecture. Are your processes ready for the next digital transformation? Visit us to learn how to take your processes from a brick and mortar to a work from anywhere environment. Please welcome our next speaker, Marjorie Schmierbach, a practice manager. Today, she will be presenting on Dynamics ERP. Who gets the final rows? FNO versus BC. Please stick around after Marjorie's session for a live Q&A. Well, welcome everyone to our Dynamics Con session. My name is Marjorie Schmierbach. I'm the Practice Manager for Finance and Operations and AX at Dynamic Consulting. I'm co-presenting today with Sean Dorward. Can I say hi, Sean? Hi, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks, Marjorie. So excited to be here on Dynamics Con 2.0, Spring 21. Uh, Sean Dord here, Practice Manager for SMB. I do work with Marjorie, and yet still we decided to do a session together. How about that for, for collaboration? You can feel free if you choose to check out my personal blog site at lifehacks365.com or follow me on Twitter. I love tweeting. All right. Well, today's topic today, what brings us all here is to talk about who will get the final rows between finance and operations and Business Central. So we know that everybody on this uh, session probably has looked at multiple other ERPs in the past. We're hoping that you've decided that Microsoft Dynamics is the place you want to be. Um, but which ERP do you use? How do you know what the difference is uh, and which platform will most help your company succeed? So we've all heard, you know, from the consulting side, generally that you'll default to finance and operations if you're a large enterprise company. And large enterprise company in Microsoft terms is Microsoft size company, right? Um, or you have a big IT budget and you're just itching to give it to Microsoft and a Microsoft partner. Uh, on the other end, we say generally use Business Central if you will have fewer than the minimum 20 users required in finance and operations or your budget for the budget for FNO uh, just won't work for you. But there has to be something else, right? I mean, we can't just to. base this decision, Sean, on how much budget somebody has to burn for their implementation, right? This is this is such a great session and a great topic, right, Marjorie? Because in our space, um, on the consulting side, we hear this question all the time: which one is better? Uh, which one is a better fit? And it's kind of interesting because I'm not sure that there is a clear-cut answer. But I think putting them head to head here in this session. Uh, is a great way to do it. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, so our goals for today's sessions are to really provide some key questions for selecting between the two tools and also to highlight some key differences between functionality. So John and I today are going to uh, mostly talk through the things that we've learned from working with each other to prepare for this uh, and also potentially show some of the um, different tools. So showing you a bit of finance and operations, probably showing you more of Business Central since we do know that we're living in the FNO track right now. Probably a lot of you are more familiar with FNO than you are with Business Central. Um, so I think the first question uh, that we came to was how much can you manage from day one, right? Uh, so finance and operations, for example, those of you who have deployed a net new uh, implementation before know that it comes empty. I mean, there's not even zip codes in it. You've got to go out and find your own zip code files, even get your addresses started, right? Um, so there's nothing in there. There's no ways to kind of quick start it out of the box for Microsoft. Of course, some partners offer um, quick start guides and, and templates and things like that that you can use. Um, it's controlled by lifecycle services, which is the kind of engine to deploy those environments and manage them going forward. Um, the tool itself is highly customizable. I've yet to see a customer who doesn't customize something, right? So your chance of customization in finance and operations is pretty much 100%. Uh, 
Um, and then you're forced to update eight times a year with new functionality coming out in each release. So all of that combined means that you need a team of people essentially to help manage your IT systems, to get your environments configured, to manage that flow of updates and testing, uh, to also do the uh, deal with the customizations and um, keep the code moving forward. Sean, how does that compare to Business Central? Yeah, emptier than empty. Is that what you said? And <laughs> <laughs> emptier than empty. Uh, maybe we'll find something on Mars. I don't know. It, 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 it's interesting to hear that. One of the things, Marjorie, through this exercise of doing this session with you is I really don't know anything um, useful about FNO except those kind of really high level talking points. So thanks for sharing that about, about getting up and running from day one. So in Business Central, there's kind of uh, several different paths because as an individual, very small organization, maybe, maybe um, you know, small mom and pop or someone who's living the life large on QuickBooks and they want to get into Business Central, rightfully so, um, we can take that experience and use wizards within Business Central to migrate your QuickBooks data over into an already kind of configured environment for you, which I think is pretty powerful um, from that easy entry point. Because you do, you, the easy entry point doesn't mean that you're limited in scope. It just means it's an, an easy way to get in the door and you still have all of the remaining ERP functions available to you. And we'll talk more about those down the road. And then there's kind of this middle of the road. You can uh, take a, a minimum value product or an MVP approach where you just, you need it customized a little bit or you need it uh, configured specifically to your organization a little bit more than a migration tool would. Um, and then you could take that and build on it, usually with consultants help, but hey, it's an ERP, at least in my mind, if I know it and I've learned it, somebody else can do that. But often there's not the time available for uh, for the learning curve when you're running a real business. So we kind of block those up into smaller sections. Um, and then lastly, there's the um, full supported implementation, which is something that most I see, at least in my experience, I'm seeing most organizations who are tried and true businesses with some good history and good tenure. Um, they're wanting a full scope of work. They're wanting to be you know, starting from scratch, like you're empty or an empty in FNO, and from a development perspective, so you're not in any way expected to develop or customize Business Central, but certainly you have those options if you want to. Uh, the, the tool is generally, I would say, and Marjorie has it on the slide there, in my experience, I'm seeing about a 50-50, about half of those full uh, scope implementations are looking for something custom. And that's uh, doesn't need to necessarily be anything large, right? Because customizations don't need, that doesn't need to be a scary word. It can be something very simple. And certainly if there's modifications that need need a, uh, an extension, if you will, added to the application. And also, you know, Marjorie mentioned about how Microsoft rolls out things for FNO. Uh, Business Central gets new releases in waves. So there's a wave one, which happens generally in April, and a wave two, which happens generally in September slash October. Notice I said generally. And all throughout the year, if there are hot fixes available, you could get those as early as uh, every, as frequent as every month. Uh, those waves, the wave one and wave two, someone who is in Business Central as a customer has the option to pause those for up to 90 days uh, so that you don't have to consume those updates right away, whereas the hot fixes every month, those are pretty, uh, pretty much just rolled out into your environment while you're sleeping. What do you think, Marjorie? Yeah, that How does that pretty similar with the updates. The eight times per year uh, updates, you can delay those and, and get a couple of versions behind uh, before Microsoft forces you to take that update. Um, but wow, Sean, you get a wizard, you just, it literally pops up and says, what do you want to use? Or how, what does that wizard look like? Right. So, so Clippy doesn't pop up like uh, back <laughs> in the office days. Uh, the wizards look pretty, pretty intuitive. They're built into the product. Uh, I, I call them like an easy entry because they're not really going to get you in the full blown configuration necessarily, mm -hmm. but they're a great way to start. So I need chart of account codes. I need users, I need permissions, I need roles. Pretty helpful. That's awesome. Well, I know everybody in the FNO world has been asking for some, you know, pre-templated version that they can select from um, other than using the demo data and then copying kind of the settings over into your own 
environment, um, which is kind of the inelegant way to do it. And I know a lot of partners have offered some templating approaches and quick starts of their own. Um, it's interesting that that Microsoft still hasn't chosen to kind of provide a you know gap approved uh, template for FNO. Uh, yeah. It seems crazy. Hey, Marjorie, did you say that you can pause your updates for a few you versions? You can you can get uh, two versions behind essentially, and that third version you have to take. Gotcha. So on our major updates, the wave one and wave two, you can't get one behind. After 90 days, you have to take that mm -hmm. one. So that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, with them coming out eight times a year, it's it's still um, around the 90 day mark. <laughs> you know, they skip a couple of updates. So uh, sometimes you can get a little bit past that 90 day mark, but it's technically considered end of life, uh, which really just means in my experience that you're going to if you have to reach out to Microsoft support, they're going to tell you update and then tell us if it's not fixed already. So, very cool. So, what do you yeah. think? Uh, I don't know. Those in the in the audience, maybe put in the chat. Which one do you think should get the uh, the rose for for this segment? I know. Right. What, I mean, I know. Sean, I think BC wins on this one. I mean, I hear this all day long that you know, why do you need to spend so much time configuring my environment? What do you mean it doesn't even have zip codes? Um, you know, it, it seems crazy to me that we're living in 2021 and, and we still can't get a quick start in F and O. So I think BC wins this one. Oh. Mm. What do you think, Sean? You know, quick starts are good to have. <laughs> quick starts <laughs> are good to have, but do they have a real place? And that is kind of the shaky ground. You know, um, if you're a brand new business, you don't have a way or you're not maybe making something or tracking inventory, we have that uh, kind of complexity. So, you know, sometimes an easy entry is uh, is great. And sometimes if you start that way, I might get myself in trouble here. It might cause you a little more trouble down the road because you're not really familiar with the kind of if this, then that to the mm -hmm. consequences of your decision. So. I, I That's a good consider, point. I would consider it a toss-up. Yeah, FNO is definitely not a DIY project. That's for sure. So you're you're probably right. A wizard may be uh, may cause more problems than it would help. <laughs> good, right. All right. So the other question uh, that we started thinking through was, what functionality do you really need? You know, FNO is a beast. It is a big ERP. Uh, it has extensive functionality in all sorts of different areas of the system, and you're getting it whether you're going to use it or not. So you're paying for the IP and the higher licensing cost, uh, and you may not need all of it. Um, Sean, it seems to me like Business Central is just a more core centralized tool. Well, I mean, it, it, one way to look at it, yeah. I mean, so it's interesting, Marjorie, like some people I talk to, they'll say Business Central uh, isn't isn't robust. It's not a fully baked ERP when the reality is that there are tens of thousands of customers have been using it for decades, right? So that's, there's one piece. But, but the other piece to your point is that there are, even though it's a full ERP and very robust, there are limitations to what comes with the software out of the box. Specifically, what I've learned from you um, through this exercise of comparing the two are some of those kind of uh, ancillary things or maybe not as common, like um, uh, I don't want to get ahead. So um, in our in our conversation, but some of those things are, are aren't out of the box, but we have a, a fairly comprehensive ISV um, pool to pull from for those solutions. So kind of like, um, although they were not 99 cents, but kind of like an app for your phone. If it doesn't quite do exactly what you want, you can kind of bolt something on. Yeah, I know I've learned through this process uh, that, you know, to me, uh, the way Business Central is today is sort of how AX or finance and operations in its previous life as AX or Xapta was before. You know, I am old enough now to remember the Xapta 3.0 days where, you know, you had to buy the system module by module and you were only paying for the IP of the modules that you needed. It created some complications uh, for sure about, you know, rolling out new functionality and, and everything's very interconnected in an ERP, as we all know, and it can sometimes be hard to pull on one thread uh, without unraveling the sweater, if you will. Um, but it's interesting to me that, that that was very much the concept of Xapta and AX back in the 
version 3.0, version 4.0, and AX 2009 days, you were really looking to that large ISV market to help you out. Um, interestingly for FNO, most of the advanced functionality that we're going to cover today actually were ISVs that Microsoft purchased and included in their core product now uh, going forward. All right, so what are some of the core functionality differences then? You know, Sean, I think the biggest one that we landed on really had to do with dimensions. So FNO is uh, an accountant's dream. <laughs> Uh, you've got unlimited dimensions, you've got entity back dimensions, and you can slice and dice by dimension uh, until you're blue in the face. I mean, using Accounting Source Explorer, using Financial Reporter, um, and then, of course, getting into Power BI and Power Platform. I mean, you can just kill it to death, right, with every slice and dice and dimension that you need and the complexity that FNO just has uh, out of the box. Um, how does that compare with Business Central? So... With Business Central, we have, you know, the, the nomenclature is we have two global dimensions mm -hmm. and those two global dimensions flow through the entire product. Uh, so think in terms of like line of business and maybe department or something like that. Um, and in addition to that, we have other mm -hmm. dimensions called shortcut dimensions. Uh, we have eight in total to usually get kind of co-assigned the global. So six additional um, and there's this thing called analysis view, which helps kind of flex that data because it's really important to be able to see it, you know, but interestingly enough, and I welcome folks to post some, some feedback in the comments here. What I see is the more dimensions that are assigned to transactions usually translates to sort of this overwhelming amount of, of, of activity that happens in the system. And I kind of wonder, you know, my, my tenure in the product doesn't go back two decades like many others, but I kind of wonder if that's why the limitation exists. Um, we, the idea of dimensions is that you can tag your data both um, you know, flexibly uh, and optionally and required. And so you kind of get this idea that maybe I want to have a dimension for sort of you know, five, six, seven, 10 things. Um, and then it, it almost feels like a little bit of a disappointment but then if you think from a performance perspective, is it really necessary or does it have a contra effect in that regard? So that's where analysis views come in and maybe starting with the end game, right? You know, how do you want to report? So we think about that through the implementation project, which again is another reason why folks who use the wizard may ultimately feel like they would have been served, serving themselves better if they had someone coach them through. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So. Let's talk through a specific scenario here then, Sean, of, of how this might look different in, two, in the two different systems. So let's imagine a scenario where it's a, it's a company that has six legal entities um, and they want to report against, you know, department, uh, site, and what else do you see <laughs> most commonly? Those are very common in the F&O space. A line of business, you know, um, okay. construction, whatever. Sure. Yeah, so let's let's use those three examples. So across then, um, you know, six legal entities, maybe there's, a, you know, a, a legal entity in Canada that needs a separate type of dimension, right, um, that they want to report on up there. How does that work when you have different dimensions defined for different legal entities in Business Central with that limitation of how many you can display? When you're consolidating your reporting, how do you do that? Yeah, it gets cumbersome, that's for sure, spe uh, specifically across entities. There's ISV products out there to help kind of remove some of that complexity, but the ideal scenario, no different from the chart of accounts, is to have that streamlined across entity. However, if you can't, there are definitely creative ways. So one of the things I mentioned a few a few moments ago was that you're not that you don't want to go into a business central implementation with the expectation of customization or development because people kind of are typically taken back when they hear that. And the reality is, is that the way it's managed through uh, the extension world in business centrals, it's very controlled and very safe, uh, given that you're using the right, the right resources. But in addition to um, the existing setup, you can leverage development to make that crossover work for consolidation. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Well, and where, then F and O, or is that is that sort of just an expectation that exists across entities that they can be mapped? Maybe. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, again, this might be an example of a way that Microsoft has sort of built FNO to be the larger enterprise tool in that it expects that you're going to have, you know, a, a bunch of different legal entities with a bunch of specific dimensional requirements that you're going to be mapping and consolidating and combining and having unique dimensions and dimension values by your different organizations, your different legal entities. So it's interesting that uh, it's just, it's, it, it, you know, it's a, I guess the, the idea here is that an enterprise organization would have that additional complexity, I guess. So maybe this really is the difference. Uh, it's not just user count and budget. Maybe this is one of the real ways that, that it defines how complex your legal entity and dimension reporting structure needs to be right. for a smaller company versus a larger company. Right. So I can just I can just hear the comments in the chat right now. <laughs> <laughs> Firing away. What um, are they saying? If we have to look into our crystal balls here. It's, it's easy to solve through development, through custom development. Yeah. It, it yeah. is. And I know. And the reason I say that sort of tongue in cheek and, and all kidding aside is because this situation, this entity, multi-entity situation, Business Central handles very well. Mm. Uh, validation handles very well. Mm -hmm. So having um, an organization that's got subsidiaries and international entities with dimension requirements that are different is not something new. It's not unheard of, specifically with Business Central's history, right? So um, being born and raised in, in Europe and, and, and how, how European organizations really do business internationally, it's, it wouldn't be uncommon for that chat to be on fire right now. And if it's not, I encourage you to do so. Let's hear, let's hear what you have to say about, about dimensions and this, this kind of situation. Yeah, and please do share in your chat and Sean and I are listening in now. Um, and this has been a very interesting conversation that I've actually pulled some of our other team members into because I'm like, you're not gonna believe this, you know? <laughs> we kind of talk through these differences. It feels like ad nauseum, Sean, because um, it really is a fascinating difference. Uh, and you know, who knows in a couple of years from now, we're probably gonna be talking about how none of this matters because you can do so much magic and Power BI to get your reporting just the way you need it. but you know, <laughs> storing this even inside of the ERPs is not as important as it once was, right? So interesting. All right, who gets the rose? Who do you think gets the rose? I think Evan O does. Come you on. This seems, this seems like a real limitation of business central to me. Limitation even or with control. customization. Limitation or control. I mean, I would oh. I don't want to play devil's advocate here just for a second. And and again, <laughs> just, just for a second. I mean, maybe on the enterprise level, because I, I don't have it, that much exposure to the, that size of a company. But when it comes to tracking and tracing of dimensions, how much is too much? And is it really neat? So I'll leave it there. Well, I mean, as an old timer, again, Xapta used to have three dimensions and that was it. And people got real creative with how to, how to use those and how to use different values and things like that. So. Um, I would say, you know, if you if you're an organization of five people, maybe it's not as important, and maybe you do need to have a little bit of a smaller scope for your reporting. I think once you hit the 100, 300, 500 employee mark, you're probably going to look for more complexity and a little bit more complex structure to your dimensions. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to beat this up, but I'm going to. So what's interesting <laughs> about what you just said is that light bulb went off. Um, you know, if you've got the the team who your, your separation of responsibilities is such that, that their responsibility is more focused and drilled down and they're not having to pick the values of many of these dimensions. That's so, that really makes a whole lot of sense to me to have as many as you can because it's, it's not a thought uh, or part of the data input that has to occur versus an organization maybe that has uh, someone responsible for a dimension, maybe five different values or 15 different values that they have to select each time. Because then you kind of get into is, even though there's something there, is it right? Um, so I like that you mentioned that, that that adds a bit of insight as well into, into it being scalable for the organization with a larger and deeper separation of responsibilities. And maybe mm -hmm. some of that is by sheer geographic location, right? You might have, yeah. you know, 10 different locations uh, versus a centralized accounting and transaction department, which we tend to see, I think, a bit more. Yeah, interesting. 
All right, Sean, you're not giving a rose to me, huh? No F and O roses for you. I'll give I'll give you the F and O rose here, but let <laughs> let let's let's hear the chat on this one, right? For the final tally, let's hear the chat. This is going to be an interesting one for sure. All right, uh, another key area that we noticed uh, in preparing for this is just user accessibility, right? So within F and O, it's very workspace centered, and the assumption there again, looking at scale of the scale and the size of enterprises that are implementing it. Um, is that there are a team of people who are doing the same job over and over and over again, and they're using the tool to tackle the work together, right? So inside the finance and operations, um, you know, you can look at a workspace, for example, in credit and collections, and you'll see a list of your tasks open and the activities that your team members have followed up on, and you can work together to collaborate and take turns calling different, you know, problem children for collecting purposes, sending out letters, um, all of that is tracked within the system, so you can be sure that Susie didn't send a letter and now Jane's going to follow up on it the next day. Um, so it's a very interesting to, me, interesting to me that Microsoft decided that that was the way to sort of make the system most accessible and usable for, for users is really to make it workspace center. Again, we're talking about multiple people doing the same task. Now, Sean, when we talked, Business Central is very different, and uh, there is some functionality there that I know is the dream of many an f and user. <laughs> so how does it look over there? So the system, the dream of many, is that what you said? Mm-hmm. Do you have well, no idea? I'm already preparing the rows for BC on this one then. <laughs> uh, uh, so Business Central uses, uh, they're called profiles loosely now, but role centers. Um, it's a predefined kind of uh, layout of your navigation and um, your permission, well, not necessarily your permissions, but what's surfaced on your home screen, for example, what's readily available at your fingertips. Uh, so that's been, and many other products use that, and Nav had used that for a while, Dynamics GP as well. But some of the beauty of that is that you can personalize it. The individual user can personalize that quite well. And not only that, but you can really stretch across different modules quite easily. So for smaller organizations, maybe in the me medium size, where they are performing more than one typical stream of responsibility, they can cross over modules quite easily um, and even interact with uh, the, the interaction with Excel. I'm sure FNO has it as well. And I don't know why we didn't talk about that. Maybe we should call an audible at the end of this, but the interaction with Excel and Business Central is pretty cool. Uh, both, you know, dropping data into Excel, but also editing appropriate data in Excel. But one of the great things that I love about Business Central is the ability to interact with um, your customers and vendors and contacts from right within Outlook. And I don't mean using their email address and responding to them necessarily as just true email functionality, but literally adding the Business Central add-in into Outlook adds a blade to the right-hand side of Outlook which surfaces an interaction of Business Central in real time where you can uh, create a, a quote or an order or an invoice or for a vendor, you can see how much you owe them if they're inquiring or when we, last time we sent them a check, uh, which is pretty cool. If you haven't seen that, be sure to check it out. I'm certain someone's showing it at DynamicsCon uh, over the next couple of days. And if not, check out my blog site. I'll be sure to put a video out, up there. Uh, I promise to have that out before the conference, so check that out too. Yeah, that's the thing I'm talking about, Sean, is, uh, you know, it's been a, a, on a wish list for a lot of people in finance and operations to have much more um, functionality that is in Outlook, really, and, and helping people drive, again, like you said, creating a quote straight from your email. I mean, that's a dream for, for users of finance and operations or checking on the status of, of a production order or something directly from Outlook. I mean, it's... Um, it just sounds crazy to, to FNL users that that's available. Um, and, you know, in the, in the times that you showed it to me as well, I mean, it's not even just creating a quote. It's literally recommending you products based on the text of the email, right? So it's really taking the next step to help you work faster and work more efficiently. That's yeah, it recognizes, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It recognizes the email address um, that you're interacting with and finds that in the system, surfaces all that information for you, uses a little bit of AI. If you love it as much as you say you do, I'll take all the credit for it. Um, it's a pretty cool tool. I will tell you when it first came out a couple years ago, maybe two years ago, three years ago, 
you know, sometimes salespeople will tell you something and then you you see it and it's really not quite as shiny as you were told. This really hit the mark. The, the Microsoft mm-hmm. did a fantastic job with this. Um, I'm not sure if many people use it, if they quite realize, um, you know, how much it could save them from distractions. You know, when you go from one app to another, if you're like me, you stop at Twitter along the way or something like that, you get distracted. Uh, but if you're able to do this all in one application on your desktop, I think it becomes you just become a little bit more pro, uh, a little bit more productive. Right. Absolutely. I know. You know. I think for FNO, Microsoft's line of thinking is that if you're using FNO, you're probably using CRM, which has a pretty robust outlook add-in as well, and you probably are doing most of your sales activity through CRM. Again, we're talking about the large enterprise customer that Microsoft envisions is not the same as what I see a lot in my work, which is more medium-sized enterprises, you know, 500 500 employees, that kind of range. Um, And so for teams like that, I think the Outlook add-in would be an incredible add to FML. So I do think, Sean, that this one is a rose to business central. I'll take it. I'll take it. Check, it, right. check out the, the ad and it'll be worth it. Um, and if you're an FNO user, you know, the, the takeaway for me is if I were an FNO user, I would be knocking on the ideas website, voting for those suggestions out there to get that kind of interaction in mm-hmm. the product. So leave a comment in, in the chat there if you know of an idea site uh, suggestion that people can go vote for for FNO to get that kind of interoperability with Outlook in, uh, into FNO. Yep. All right, moving on then to the next area that's a big difference. And oh, if I go back, actually, Sean, you mentioned Excel uh, and its interoperability with Business Central. I think the reason why we didn't choose to talk about that today was it's pretty robust in finance and operations as well. Oh, gotcha. It's an area where I was really surprised to see that both tools worked quite well and quite natively with Excel in different ways. So I think it was a strength of both of the tools. Very cool. You have to show me that. All right. Core functionality differences. Inside of finance and operations, there is advanced warehousing, right? Um, Which came in, as many recall, who've been around the space for a while, as a ISV solution that Microsoft bought and merged in with their core product. The non-advanced warehouse functionality inside of finance and operations is pretty close to what's in Business Central. Um, so the things that it's missing then uh, are that FNO has our license plating. Um, it has a warehouse application that has barcode scanning, and it has sort of decent quality control depending on exactly what you need to use it for. Um, Sean, when we talked, it seemed like Business Central had most of that except for maybe the license plating and the barcode scanning. So that's that's about the quality control, and the reality is is that. There aren't near as many business central customers who have that extended requirement like an enterprise organization would. Now, if before you thrash me in the comments, that's what those ISVs exist for, for those cases where we do have that requirement. And if you start with business central, you may not need it right now. Um, but down the road in a year, two years, if you need it, you don't have to look to go to re-implement to something else. You can get an add on for those things if you need them. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, there's still quite the robust ISV market in the FNO world, too. Um, it just seems like Microsoft has acquired so many ISVs and continues to bake in more and more functionality. And I know the licensing split, right, between finance and supply chain, I think they're eventually going to go back to the module based pricing, right? Um, but it's interesting to me how much Business Central is just a much more simple product, but the ISVs you know, provide pretty much the same functionality that you get inside of finance and operations. So interesting. I don't know. Who do you think gets the rose for that oh. one? I mean, I think FNL has incredibly robust advanced warehousing functionality. Yeah, I would agree that that um, that is true, that it does. Yeah. Wait, did you just give it a rose? I, I was just going to say... <laughs> I was just going to say. You you're, were just going to say what? <laughs> with FNO, you're paying for everything. You are. You yes. need it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, so to that end, if 
It really depends on your situation, but we'll give the rose for this one to FNO. Yay. Great. Uh, other than that, there's some other core functionality difference. There's some whole modules, right, that are missing or that you can get from an ISV, right? That's uh, Sean's refrain today. Uh, but retail is one, you know, transportation management, um, heavy project management. I know Business Central has some functionality. Um, even credit and collections, you can sort of get there, but it doesn't have all the collection letter functionality and, and tracking, activity tracking that FNO does. It just it felt like looking at the two systems, Sean, it was just a much more pared down tool that really could be powerful for some medium sized businesses with with the help of an ISV. Yeah, definitely the ISV market is is a huge help to go the extra step. I uh, don't want to confuse or or have someone think that Business Central isn't going to meet their needs. It, requires some requirements gathering to understand. But if you know you need transportation management and you're evaluating these two, that should be a directive to you to talk more uh, on the FNO side, um, at least in my mind. The same true for, for some other things, retail. Certainly we have solutions for that on the business central side. But if you, especially if you're in the FNO space or you have experience with it, you know, you have those, those modules uh, that you can light up, if you will, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of pretty empowering as a business to know that it may not be a requirement right now, but if and when it is, we have it. Uh, so that's I, I find that pretty interesting from from a from an individual like myself who's accustomed to leveraging ISVs and extensions the way that I have in custom development. Uh, the FNO uh, all kind of inclusive approach is interesting. Yeah, I think so. I mean, certainly you're getting a higher license cost, right, to carry the cost of all the IP that you're just getting baked into FNO. Um, I do think it's interesting, like you mentioned, that that process growth within an organization, you're not immediately up against buying another license if you decide to, to leverage, for example, project management and accounting after you go live or um, you decide that you're going to start managing you know, you're going to buy a trucking line to transport your materials and you need transportation management. You already own the product, you already own the tool. Uh, it's kind of a no brainer to continue to use it to its fullest extent. Um, I get inquiries like that all the time of, we've never considered using FNO for our fixed assets or using this other product, but we'd really love to, you know, fully get the value from our licensing that we're spending every month. What other modules can we bring in? Um, and really get you all in one system end to end. I think that's a really powerful um, way to think of it for, for a medium-sized organization in particular. Really get the bang for your buck for your, for your monthly licensing. Agreed. It's interesting. when If you use those kind of extended modules in F&O, does it change your, your approach to what happens in the eight rollouts that happen, or are those all included at the same time? They're all included at the same time, yeah. So you're getting fixes for project management, whether you use it or not, um, to my knowledge anyway. <laughs> if I'm wrong, I'm sure you'll let me know in the chat, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so you're getting updates for things that you may or may not use. Um, just kind of part and parcel, I guess, of having such a big, uh, in you know, threaded together kind of ERP system. Gosh. Now, interestingly for me, Sean, I came into this session thinking for sure one of the big differences between the two systems would be Business Central can't handle multiple legal entities. That was what I had always been told is if you have an international company with multiple legal entities with, that require some localizations, then you can't use Business Central. Is that true? Well, it's definitely not true. Uh, you certainly can. In fact, it's kind of it's kind of its entry point um, years ago was its uh, sort of its claim to fame, multi-currency and multi-entity and the way it handles it, both from a consolidation and communication perspective. So if I'm communicating with a company in Canada, I can communicate exclusively in the Canadian dollar and somebody uh, in Europe with their currency as well. So the other thing, Marjorie, I wanted to mention, kind of a little bit more of a tipping of the hat to FNO as well. With Business Central, as you may remember, I had mentioned we get two rollouts, uh, wave one and wave two. And if we solve the TMS issue with an ISV, your software is going to include that in the update. Whereas for Business Central, we have to manage that update separately. 
So there's, uh, you know, the ISV has to prepare their code with the new release. It's not a, it's not a large undertaking, but it is sort of a little administrative step that has to happen. Although when I say little, still very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have that same issue on the FNO side. If, if someone does choose to use an ISV, um, it, 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 again, like you said, it's not a lot of work, but it's still work. You know, you still have to coordinate getting that updated model and things like that from the ISV vendor. Awesome. All right, what's the next question then? What else are you going to use? I mean, how much do you want to integrate to Dataverse, right? So finance and operations uh, has seen a lot of investment around the use of dual right. It's synchronous, it's bi-directional, it supports online and offline mode, and you can create your own custom um, connections and integrations into Dataverse, which is, of course, as we all know, where uh, formerly known as the common data service, where Power Platform, CRM, all of that good stuff lives. How does that compare to Business Central? So interesting, um, common data service or Dataverse has been on the roadmap for Business Central for some time, we started to see some change, I don't know, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. Um, and it really hasn't changed all that much, at least in terms of the depth into the system or the width, I suppose, into the system. So we can get the contact, the customer, shipping method and agent, as you see on the screen there, and some other things uh, to sync between uh, customer engagement. Um, so the data is surfaced in the CDS. I know just from conversations with others that Microsoft fully intends to keep integrating Business Central into Dataverse. I feel like that's been told for a while. I'm just being honest and I don't know, you know, I'm not trying to pick that apart, but I think, I feel like that's what we've been told for a while. Haven't seen a gigantic amount of traction. Um, or change, but that doesn't mean it won't change aggressively in a short amount of time. Um, you can move uh, your data into Dataverse. Uh, you have to do it yourself um, so that it can be used uh, and uh, for other things. Um, so we have an, an sort of out of the box integration with customer engagement, which works pretty well. I would consider it very limited though. Most organizations need a bit more and those handful of things. Um, and I think only two or three of them are bi-directional. Yeah, I mean, in my experience with dual right, um, for a simple, I say simple, for a basic kind of CRM implementation um, with FNO, it usually covers most of what you need to pass back and forth, you know, as far as quotes and contacts and things like that, sales orders. Um, it gets a little complex, the bigger and more heavily used uh, it, the system is, you know, so using it for, um, Field service, things like that, it's it gets a little dicier about whether or not the functionality is fully there yet. Um, and we've built some custom integrations between some of the applications in the Dataverse platform um, to talk to FNL because, you know, like you said, it's been on the roadmap for a long time. The dual write functionality every day, it seems like they're releasing something that's better and more entities, more, more ways that it can talk. Um, but it does still... Most of the time, I find it does require a custom integration level, uh, some level of custom custom integration creation, um, in order to get FNO truly connected into the Dataverse. All right, so, Sean, <laughs> in conclusion, who do you think gets the rose? Um, I I don't know who I think should get the rose. But I think what I'd love, I'm, I'm excited for the, for the Q&A session when we get finished here. Uh, I'm excited to see the comments and hear what everyone thinks. I think typically one thing we do know, regardless of the rows, is that it's not an easy decision, right? This, these are very mature and robust ERP systems with um, a different uh, implementation strategy and available availability of functionality. So it's not like you can just follow one simple path. It probably is best to consult with an expert, someone with a lot of experience in both. Um, you know, for me, uh, based on the things that we talked about today and the time that you and I spent exploring which one, what one can do versus the other, I do think that it's not an easy decision. 
And, but it is one that should be really fully vetted. And an organization, if I were responsible for an organization, I would wanna make sure that I do due diligence and make sure that I understand what are the pros and cons of each. Uh, in the end, um, I'm certain that you'll make the right choice knowing uh, all the options available. It's not just about licensing. It's not just about implementation budget, is it? What do you, what do you think? Right, I mean, I was really surprised and impressed. I came in to this idea thinking surely f &L wins at damn near everything, right? <laughs> but turns out it doesn't. It, you know, Business Central is much more robust than I thought it was. I think it would make good sense for somebody, even if you're over that 20 person user um, minimum that f &L requires. I could see several companies, customers of mine that could live inside of Business Central and probably utilize it pretty well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always surprised uh, to learn more about other ERP softwares. And, and in this case, I really expected FNO to walk away with it. And to be honest, I think for the, like you mentioned, the budget uh, for implementation and the licensing costs, the ongoing costs, I think Business Central is a real contender um, for some of these smaller organizations. Again, if you're, you know, a 500 employee org, you know, you're, you're probably not going to want to use Business Central. You need some more complex processing power and things like that. But I was very impressed with the functionality that's in Business Central today. And I definitely think that doing our homework in this way, Sean, has, has better prepared us to counsel our customers and help them understand the differences and not just point them in a direction based on their budget. You know? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think I felt the same. I felt just because I you know, I really haven't had much exposure to FNO, Marjorie. Um, I really expected there to be a large difference between the two. When the reality is, is they're sort of complementary of one another, mm -hmm. and they're they're not the same. They definitely are different. I do think there's a better fit for each organization, uh, one or the other. Um, and it really just depends on the organization's vision for the future, their their current requirements, and their vision for the future. But I don't know. Let's 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 uh, go see what everyone thinks, and and maybe we won't get uh, beat up too badly during the Q and A session. What do you think? Right. I mean, I think people are going to have a lot of questions. So I'm really curious to hear from the audience about what their expectation was of of what the difference is between Business Central and FNL. What did you guys think before this session? You know, what is the different functionality? Why do you why do we choose to sell FNO to customer A over Business Central? I'd be curious to hear that. If you're a customer that's in the selection process, I'd be really curious to hear if this presentation has altered your view of either of the systems and pushed you in one direction over the other. Now, Sean, the other thing we didn't talk about is kind of growth within the system. Um, and I do think that that's a reason why a lot of people end up in FNO is they have plans to grow pretty intensely over the next year or two and, and don't want to kind of double dip on an ERP implementation. Um, that said, I think that a lot of the business central functionality does exist inside of FNO, and I'm really looking forward to the day where we have a customer who wants to grow up and, and kind of move into a more complex ERP system and, and chooses FNO to do that in. So yeah. we'll see what the audience has to say. Uh, opening up for questions, I guess, now and comments. Um, and hopefully you all can provide us with some insight and some things that we overlooked, some things that we missed in our research. Uh, any examples that you have from real world scenarios, if you want to see how they might shake out differently in between the systems or who you think, which software we think would be the best fit for a particular scenario, put it in the comments. Let's talk about it. Totally agree. Marjorie, excellent job. What a fun session. I learned a lot. I hope you did too. I hope everyone else did. We'll, we'll, we'll see you over at the Q&A. Yeah, thanks everybody. Well, hey there, Marjorie. Hey, how's it Great. going? Happy St. Pat's. What's that? Happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone who joined us for our session. Uh, so I, I, everybody know, should note that we're wearing red for the rose theme, not green for St. Pat's Day, I guess. Uh, we just took a different direction. So we hope everybody had a great time and, and maybe learned a little bit here today. Marjorie, I have a couple things that I took um, and now the chat is just 
going crazy over there. So we need uh, maybe need a little bit of help there. But I have a couple questions that I pulled from the queue that I thought we could talk about if that's okay. Absolutely. So one thing that Annalisa has asked is, uh, is we and they mentioned we are in the very early stages of switching between NAV 2013 uh, to FNO. And have you helped? She wants to know if you've helped customers on that journey, and maybe do you have any advice uh, or are there any kind of important gotchas to look out for? Yeah, I mean, we haven't yet, Sean. We've had a few opportunities, prospects come through that are doing that very move. Um, and we keep telling people we want to use our superpowers together for good and, and help a NAV customer move into the FNO space. Um, we haven't done that yet. I think in these conversations, um, you know, we were focusing more on the differences in functionality. So, Annalisa, I don't know if any of these areas of functionality resonated with you or there's something that your company focuses on. Um, that you might want more advanced warehousing or something like that as you move into the FNO space. Um, lucky for you, uh, a lot of the language is similar, right? So that's half the battle, I think, with moving to a new system is learning the the basic process flows and the language and and how to navigate around. They're, they look and feel very much like the process flows are also very similar. Um, and the language, of course, is very similar as well. So. I think you're on a great path to move to FNO. Very exciting time. Um, you know, as FNO is the enterprise tool, it kind of feels like growing up a little bit, I hope, into the, the flagship ERP of Microsoft. Um, but yeah, I can't think of anything. Is there anybody who's gone through this that's in the chat today? I'd be very interested to hear about that experience and what processes to look for. Sean, is there anything from our conversations that, that rang to you that somebody would want to watch out for? Interestingly enough, um, I don't know about anything that they would want to watch out for. I guess, uh, you know, coming from an ISV to an end of product, uh, I've worked with some of that kind of situation where we're taking an ISV and maybe developing it into an or business central. So it could be a little bit of an equatable experience. And my only thought there is, is to just it truly, truly, truly don't just hear user acceptance testing, but live it, breathe it. Um, it is going to be what makes or breaks every micro part of that project. I myself have worked on a project in the past where it was a customer coming from from FNO to an on-premise. Yes, it was it was surprising. But what what happened in that situation was they felt like they were oversold FNO, and then they realized that. You know their their ongoing costs really weren't worth the things that they thought they were going to be using because they were just on the shelf at the moment. So they wound up regressing. I guess you could call that into uh, Navision on premises and uh, a couple a few years back. That probably is a similar experience, although I would suggest it might be a little easier, right? Because uh, you're taking something that's very wide and putting it into a narrower spot where it properly belongs. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Joel, thank you for that smart Alec comment that Sean actually directly addressed moving from FNO to Business Central. Uh, sounds like it happened at one point. Um, and Sean, I agree with you. I have spoken with a few prospects that say they've been pointed to FNO and in talking with them, we've realized that they do not need FNO's advanced functionality and it is going to be more, a more cumbersome and expensive tool. And also I realize in that process that I am the worst FNO salesperson because I'm literally <laughs> taking customers who think they need FNO and sending them over to your practice. <laughs> yeah, just and just because I have I have an experience moving FNO down to to nav does not mean that that there's something wrong with that choice. I think I saw in the comments early, it, this is really a case by case decision that has to be made uh, at every organization when they're making the ERP decision. So uh, there's that. Um, Marjorie, are you checking the chat there while I go to the next question? Yeah, I am. Yep. Great. So the next question that I have here is missing. I can't find my, my sheet. <laughs> That's okay. Um, let's see if we can find one here. From Michael, he said, how long are BC projects on average? Even though it's complex and difficult, you can still implement FNO in a couple months. Hmm. Good question. So average is tricky. What does that mean to be, you know, what is an average? We like to say the entry point is at minimum three months. Um, and usually they're three to six months, uh, somewhere in there uh, for an implementation. If you're part of our team, you'll hear me say this a lot, right? Not rushed. 
Um, we want to be quick. We know that everybody has a full-time job to do in addition to the implementation, but uh, we want it to be right because we want you to benefit and grow with the product, not just have it right for right now, but in six months when you're ready to make a change or a new report, you're prepared for that. So we do all that. And really um, that comes down to uh, what the what the project requirements are. But I, usually three to six months is a good budget. How about an F and O? I know in that case, push come to shove, it was quick. What is it? I, what is a typical, dare I ask, what is a typical FNO implementation timeframe like? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the level of complexity and how much the customer wants to take on versus outsource and all these things. Um, but of course, like always, but usually 12 to 18 months for a full kind of end to end multiple modules being used, um, assuming, you know, manufacturing or project management or, you know, some sort of product is being sold <laughs> and managed items managed in the system. Um, you know, depending on how much culture change they need, depending on how um, how much, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. But I would say on average, I usually say 12 to 18 months is a good expectation to, to set. Very good. That's not too bad for a large enterprise implementation. I don't think anyway. Um, we've definitely had Business Central and NAV projects that are about a year long. You know, it just depends on the expectations. Damien mentions in the chat, in my experience dealing with add-ons, talking about uh, FNO having it built in and maybe you're not using it, maybe you need to use it later, uh, but using the add-ons versus third parties was a pain in the neck. Uh, team one throat to choke uh, is, is the comment there. And you know, there's a lot of truth behind that. The more vendors involved in any process, the harder it is. That's where your project management team is going to be key. Just a little bit of a tip there. Uh, one Another question here is from Brian. I suppose it's not or not a question, but a statement, not much of a hot take. It seems apparent that either you need the complexity of FNO or you don't. Um, and that's a pretty fair statement. I don't I don't disagree with that, but I do think that if you peel back the layers just a little bit, you'll start to feel like a decision is making itself apparent when you're going down this path. You know, whether that's FNO and MBC or or either of those products to any other product, I think. Um, what do you think there, Marjorie? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that was our, our general uh, assessment was if you're a five person company, Business Central obviously makes sense for you. If you're a 5,000 person company, FNO obviously makes sense to you. Um, but what about those 100 to 200 employee sized companies? What What is the driving force in either direction for them? Um, so yeah, it, it did surprise me that um, a lot of the complexity that FNO has is not needed when you're a hundred person company. Um, and so business central um, could be a much better fit for you, depending on those other areas of functionality that you may or may not need. And again, what your tolerance is for ISVs and how many throats you have to choke and things like that. Very good. Totally agree. And I'll just mention a, another question here I saw from Damien. Sorry for asking silly questions. We appreciate the questions. I accept the ones from Joel. Those we'll leave for later. But I know EC used to have a dodgy, non-object-oriented programming language. Uh, I assume that's changed dramatically. So I personally am not familiar with the old uh, language. It has changed over the past four, three or four years. And from what I hear from folks who are developers, it is so much easier to program uh, and, to, and to spin things up. And I see that not just in the turnaround time from our dev team, but also just folks who I hear or doing simple one, two lines of code that, and they're not really developers. So it has changed dramatically in that sense, um, for sure. All right, um, another question. Marjorie and Sean, where would your rows go as regards to administration of user permissions? It's my understanding that FNO is basically about permissions to use components of the user interface like menus, forms, and buttons, whereas BC is mostly normally about permissions to use data from the database, tables, fields, create, update, delete. Whew. For example, are both approaches good for segregation of responsibilities to avoid fraud and to prevent ordinary users from seeing confidential financial numbers? So I'll answer from the BC side. Um, there's there's a lot in that question, rightfully so, but I'll pick apart the one that stands out to me, separation of responsibilities. So most certainly role-based permissions is part of Business Central. I'm certain it is, Marjorie, and FNO as well. Uh, designed specifically for separation of responsibilities and, and all sorts of mitigation of risk, 
along the way. <clears throat> Very, in my opinion, it's not a pessimistic security approach. It's not nor optimistic. I find it very middle of the road when it comes to, if you have access to this area, you have access to everything on that window. It takes a little bit of tweaking and maybe an ISV to control certain fields on that window. Great. So I don't know if I would give BC the rose, but it's it, it does the job. Um, looks like we're getting the hook, Marjorie. Um, yeah. I'll let you close this out. Who got the rose, guys? Let's head over to the forums to chat more about this. I know we didn't get to all your questions, but hopefully we can move these on over there and help you all out. Thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate it. We hope you learned a lot. Thanks, guys.